computers. When I was finishing up my master's degree, I was working at Harvard in the computer lab when they were building Mark IV. A large room-sized computer, but now this artificial intelligence stuff is amazing. LQ? Yes? Schedule a doctor's appointment. No problem. I'm working on it. When Danielle brought along the idea of working with robotics for the elderly, I said, are you kidding me? Will older people connect to a robot? And she said, I don't know. Let's research and find out. <laughs> Danielle grew up here in this suburb of Atlanta. Her parents spent much of their childhoods in Israel and then in the U.S. We as immigrants, we understood that we might need to work a little harder. In fact, I feel that rather than taken away from Danielle, it gave her so much more because she understood the fact that you need to run after your dreams and work really hard no matter what the challenges are. School didn't come easily for Danielle. I have dyslexia, and that very much affected my self-esteem academically. The principal of the school did not recommend her to take advanced classes. She fought for it, and she got into it, and she did very well with them, too. Danielle's first job out of grad school was at X the secretive research facility founded by Google. It's known for dreaming up all kinds of wacky, far-flung ideas. Can you tell us about the moonshots you worked on? <laughs> no, I can't tell you too much about the projects that I worked on. I can't say that I was working on robotics. She loved the job, but wanted to work on something that would reach real consumers sooner. So she left X after a year and joined Intuition Robotics. She's been working in the field for four years now, and it took her a while to find her footing in a male-dominated industry. I've gone to different meetups where there'll be like a circle of men with their like zip-up jacket with their like company logo on it and a beer in their hand, and I'll come in with lipstick, and nobody wants to talk to me. This is my closet. So at first she did her best to fit in, wearing a pair of glasses she didn't need, and toning down her style. So what's the kind of thing you used to wear to a conference? Stuff like this, blousey things that make you look like you're 40. <laughs> <laughs> but that got old after a while. And what's the kind of thing you wear now? Now it's like I just enjoy being kind of expressive and playful in what I wear. Before we wrap up for the day, Danielle has one more LEQ tester to visit. Joseph is 97, and he's had the robot in his home for eight months. How are you? I'm fine. How are you? Good. <laughs> Has Ms. Ali Q been? She always tells me to take a drink of water <laughs> at least four times a day. So we added a whole bunch of new uh -huh. facts to Ali Q. Did you know that a cup of chopped red bell pepper contains more vitamin C than an orange? Okay. What did you think of that? Certainly, the, the uh, print was, I could see that okay. quite clearly. What about this? Well, I can see that. Ella Q, play music. No problem. It will begin shortly. By 2050, almost half a billion people are going to be 80 or older. And if current trends continue, more and more are going to be like Joseph and Betty, living alone. Ella Q, stop.
Today, both of them are doing okay. But some of Danielle's other participants have been struggling. Is it kind of hard to leave them at the end of the day? It is. Some of our testers are pretty advanced in the stages of depression through loneliness and isolation. And at times, I know that LQ is cheering them up in their day, mm -hmm. but I know that it's only part of the way. No source of artificial intelligence robots will ever be able to replace humans mm -hmm. and human companionship or human care. The key to Danielle's work is to embrace that very limitation of machines. Robots should help humans do what they love, help humans interact with more humans, help humans in general. Not pull humans away from humans, not take human jobs and leave humans without purpose. Whether it's in our workplaces or in our homes, robots are soon going to be everywhere. And it's up to Danielle to make sure this robot-filled future leaves us just a little better off. So don't be afraid. And if you are afraid, come and join us. Because I promise it's a friendly place. Times are tough, jobs are scarce, it's risky to be outside and around others. Seems like there's very few ways to make extra money during a pandemic. So I guess I'll just hunker down and binge social media until this all blows over. <sighs> Wait, don't these people make money? How do these people make money? Streamers, YouTubers, Twitch stars, how do they make money? Is it a lot? Is it a lot of work? I know, I gotta ask somebody in the biz, and I got just the guy, Austin John Plays. Is, this is your full-time job now, right? As of November of last year, yes. This was always just kind of like a side thing. Like, any money that I made from doing my videos and whatever else, I never touched that, because I didn't really think of that as being like real money. And then it started coming in more and more. And then it was like, I hit my first day that I broke a grand. And I was like, this is actually gonna be money. How did the YouTube channel come to be? When the game Pokemon Sun and Moon oh. came out for the 3DS, there was like things that I learned about the game. And then I, I wanted to just share that information with people. And at the time, I didn't have any way to capture a screen or anything, so I found, like, generic footage, and I kind of put it all together with so much editing. And that video got six views. And then two days later, I made another one, and that one got 12 views. And then I just started pumping out more and more content, and people were like, this guy knows what he's talking about. And it really just started building on top of itself, and then it was like, <sighs> my channel really focuses on tips and tricks, so I play a straight 18 hours and I'll finish the game or get to about the 40 hour mark and then I'll make my first video. While I'm going through, I have a giant notepad, scribbles everywhere and I make these notes of like the things that stumped me so I know the things that may stump other people. Uh, what do you need to think about if you're building your YouTube channel? One, you need to do something that you're passionate about. Not that you like, not that you think you're gonna make money on, something you're passionate about. This other thing is something that other people are passionate about. It holds a special place to them. And third is, it needs to be something that people are gonna seek out information on. In order to enter into the marketplace, you either need to be better than everyone else, you either need to be faster than everyone else, or you need to be more accessible than everyone else. 
and you can't be more accessible because it's already on the platform. Granted, if you understand how the algorithm works, which is very similar to Google Analytics, then yeah, you can have a little bit of a head start. But if you're not doing it faster and if you're not doing it better than everyone else, then why should anyone watch your channel? So my income as a YouTuber kind of breaks down to three different ways. One, which is the bulk of it, which is ad revenue. Whenever you go and you watch a video and then there's an ad and then you wait five seconds and you hit the bottom right corner and then you go on to the next video or a non-skippable ad or the video starts immediately, you get the little banner ad at the bottom or uh, if you scroll down from the video, the first thing that shows there is an ad. Those are the four different types of ads that can appear on every single YouTube video. And all of them pay a certain amount. It varies on lots of things, like the country of the person who posts it, the country of the person who watches it, uh, the time of year, where you are in the quarter, if there's anything going on with uh, a reduction in ad revenue. Like, great example, COVID-19, companies weren't as spending as much on advertising. So because of that, CPM went down. Uh, CPM stands for a click per thousand. I'm using the Roman numeral for a thousand. And that means that for every 1,000 views, you get a certain amount of money. Now, on low ads, when I first started off, my CPM was 30 cents. So every 1,000 views, I made 30 cents. But then once I signed with an MCN and I started making more quality content and more engaging content, some of my better videos and certain times of the year, I can see CPMs as high as 12 to $14. And there's a big fluctuation between, you know, if I post a video when there's no ads being spent, like January and February, that's the reason a lot of your favorite YouTubers and also TV shows don't post new videos uh, in that time of year because ad rates are down. Why are they going to make content then? Instead, you're recording and you're bulking up for when ad revenue is higher. The second way that a YouTuber makes uh, income is support crowdfunding things like that when i first started off patreon was really the only option but then they started rolling out supporters and members for youtube channels so whenever i have a live stream you can click a button and then you can become a member and then you get uh special icons next to your name i believe they're called badges or on any video you can hit the join button and that helps support the channel and then the third aspect of that would be merch and for me, my merch has been somewhat basic. In fact, I'm wearing one of my t-shirts from last year right now. You have to endure the times that your first video gets six views, that you post it on Reddit and they say, shut up, and then an auto mod bans you. You have to go through that because until you go through that and you discover why you're doing it, you're not doing it for other people. You're doing it for yourself. If you're not loving what you do, then it's not worth it. Huh. So make a channel about something that I'm passionate about. Oh, sweet. I guess I can make the channel about that. Now, how do I grow an audience? do I get popular? It's all about diversification, right? You have to have a massive Twitter following. You have to have a massive Instagram following. You have to have a massive YouTube following. Of course, you have to be on Twitch, which is the key platform, but basically any way you can get in front of your audience, you can engage with your audience, um, it is going to drive those clicks, which ultimately drives the advertiser revenue that you get back from all of these platforms. It's me and Dan playing video games and talking in a funny manner over them. They're not just people who are good at games. They're actually people who are good at online engagement, online entertainment, first and foremost. You have the right to remain stylish. Anything you wear can and will be used against you in the court of fashion. The streamer is either very, very talented at the game the best player in the game is generally going to draw a crowd because people like watching people who are very good. On the other hand, they're either very, very good or funny, charismatic, whatever it is on that side. Oh, no. You know, it becomes 
more of a show where they talk about other things outside of the gaming world and gaming becomes really just a backdrop and an excuse to engage with that audience. There, there were those weird like Ronald McDonald like straight to VHS movies. You remember those? I'm personable, I'm chatty. I would kind of, you know, when boring things were happening in the game, I would ramble on about, you know, movies I'd watched or books I'd read and, you know, or conversations I'd had and stuff like that. And so I think being personable was a big part of that. It's not just getting on and playing games. It's getting on and being an entertainer. You are putting on a show. All right, now let me go ahead and grab the samurai sword that every gym has. Okay, he's dead. To have a larger audience and, and to have that audience, I think, stay with you, you have to bring something extra. You, know? you have to find your niche. You have to find what works and what connects with the audience and, and what makes them laugh and what makes them keep coming back. Then you got to make it a little more exciting, all right? Throw in a hanging bishop. Have everybody in suspense for a moment. I think the real most important thing is is to just get used to being on camera, like in any... Exciting, all right? Throw in a hanging bishop. Have everybody in suspense for a moment. I think the real most important thing is is to just get used to being on camera like in any sort of performance thing is get used to talking on camera um you know i was my first few videos were terrible but because i sat down and did it for six to eight hours a day i just got used to talking and i got over that uncomfortable hump if you go into twitch purely with the expectation that you're going to make money make a job out of it have all this growth and it's going to be great you're probably going to burn out prior to getting to that point because there's very little payoff for a long time, right? Like multiple years generally before you really start to see a payoff. And so, you know, those first few times you're streaming, nobody is there. One person shows up every 30 minutes, says hi, maybe, and leaves, right? Like it's very uh, discouraging, I think, for a lot of people. And so you have to be there just loving it. You have to love talking to yourself when nobody is around. You have to love just the game that you're playing, all of that stuff, because it takes a while. And I think a majority of people burn out prior to getting to the, like, profitable point of it. And there you have it. My very own YouTube, Twitch, Discord, and streaming channels all ready to go live. It's a veritable social media ecosystem just on the verge of thriving. So don't forget to smash like and subscribe and visit my Patreon for perks. Also, go to my merch page. And one last thing, stay cool, my friends. is Bloomberg Business Week. Insight from the reporters and editors who bring you America's most trusted business magazine, plus global business, finance, and tech news as it happens. Bloomberg Business Week with Carol Masser and Tim Stenebeck on Bloomberg Radio. And a happy Friday's Eve, everybody. This is Carol Masser along with Madison Mills of Bloomberg Quick Tech. As you know, Tim is on leave. It is... Friday's Eve. It is Thursday, April 27, 2023, and we've got a lot going on, Maddie. A lot going on and kind of a good day when it comes to the trade, maybe. It's a, it's a bull, yeah, it's a bullish one for, you know, certainly the equity side. If you're trying to short this market, sorry, this one's for the bulls. Uh, we're going to get into it. Stock's up. Yields have moved back up to 
earnings and economic news really driving a lot of the think and certainly the conversation. We're going to get into more with our Mike McKee in just a moment. In the meantime, it is a big day for earnings, Amazon and Intel after the closing bell. And then, of course, as Carol, you were mentioning, big day for economic reports that mm -hmm. show how the U.S. is in kind of the worst of both worlds here. Sorry, Fed. It's not easy being Jay Powell and company, yeah. uh, and especially when he's getting pranked, but we'll get into that a little bit <laughs> later on. Uh, we're also going to talk about when it comes to chips, we talked about Intel after the closing bell. We're going to tell you about the European semi company that really defines the global chip war. It's a great story by our Ian King. And we can't forget the story that started our week as the most important story, First Republic. They're stuck between a rock and a hard place. I mean the story, one of those stories that keeps on giving, right? Yep. It's one of those again. Uh, that stock, by the way, it is rallying, but still down uh, more than 90% for the year. The cover story of Bloomberg Business Week on the weekly injections that help people lose tons of weight. The cost, it's going to shock you, and there's still some questions about how healthy it makes individuals. Yeah, really expensive. Speaking of, we are going to end our show with how private equity runs and wrecks America. Two New York Times bestselling authors on their new book about about, quote, the plunderers, Carol. All right, so lots to come certainly here on Bloomberg Business Week. In just a moment, Maddie and I are going to head over to our TV colleagues to talk a little bit more about the trade and the earnings to come. In the meantime, we do have equities pretty much hovering near their best levels of the session. Quite a rally underway, in particular among those tech names, up 2.4%. But check out the S&P 500. It's up about 2%, so the broader market gaining ground as well. Time to head over to Romaine and Scarlet. Maddie and I joining them for Countdown to the Close, starting now. Countdown to the Close, Bloomberg's comprehensive cross-platform coverage ahead of the U.S. market close starts right now. And right now, we're about 60 minutes away from the closing bell. Romaine Bostic here alongside Scarlett Fu, joined right now by our colleagues Carol Master and Madison Mills. Welcome to our audiences across all of our Bloomberg properties, television, radio, originals, and those folks streaming on YouTube. Carol, yeah. two days ago, we were talking about how this market had finally broken out of its range. Unfortunately, that was to the downside. Today, we've also broken out of that range. It's to the upside, and it's in a big way. 2% gains pretty much across the board in U.S. equity markets. Yeah, really broad-based in terms of the rally. Certainly outperformance among the tech sector, but yeah, check out the S&P 500. Most names are higher. What's interesting, and I always feel like an important indicator uh, of the economy, what's going on with semiconductors? And we get a big read after the closing bell today. Of course, Intel reporting. But take a look. The SOX is just up about six-tenths of a percent in today's session. you got some major outperformance. Performers, KLL, KLA, excuse me, uh, that's up about 7%. Semi equipment company, we had the results last night, third quarter beat. Some analysts saying it signals maybe a bottom ahead for that one. Wolf Speed, though, I think you were talking about that yesterday, Romain. Yeah. It is down almost 22%. Uh, makes semi products like your silicon carbide. Uh, its results prompted a downgrade. Uh, and then you've got Intel up about 1.9%, but just a tale of different semis. Uh, we'll see what happens when Intel reports, Maddie. Yeah, and Romain, I want to go back to what you were saying about the trading range because the S&P 500 index no longer forming that series of lower lows and lower highs. If you look at the 200-day moving average here, uh, this data, by the way, compiled by Bloomberg Intelligence and Jess Menton put it out for us, so shout out to her. But you're starting to see the first major green shoots of technical support since 2021. So the bulls, they're kind of winning today and the bears, not so much, Romain. Yeah, absolutely. We talk about an S&P 500. Earlier today, I was saying that the S&P 500 was on track to have its best day in about four weeks. Well, nix that. Right now, you're looking mm -hmm. at a 1.99% gain, 4,136. This would be the best day for the S&P 500 since January 6th, and not far off from being the best day of the year. Similar stories right now for the Dow Jones Industrial Average, up about 1.6%. The Nasdaq Composite up about 25 for its best day going back to at least February 2nd, and the Russell 2000 doesn't want to be left out of this either. Scarlet up about a percent on the day. Yeah, a lot of green and big green numbers at that, and you have more than four stocks higher for everyone that is down on the New York Stock Exchange. So add it all up, you look at the 11 sector groups, and green across the board there too, with the laggards here up at least six tenths of one percent. Yeah, absolutely. Let's talk about, though, uh, some of the leaders here. And you see that green bar is there. A big part of that is because big tech is doing what big tech is supposed to do, keep this market afloat. Meta Platforms, a phenomenal day. 15% gain right now on the on the back of its earnings yesterday. And then you have Amazon earnings coming after the bell and investors not waiting around. Those shares up about 5% here on the 
the day right now. Best day for that stock going back to early February. That's not all peaches and cream out there. Caterpillar shares have been in the red for a good portion on the day. Order slowdown was certainly apparent in some of the numbers that it gave. And keep an eye on Mobileye. Similar softness that we're seeing on the order flow there. Those shares down 21%. That's part of the micro picture. You go back to the macro picture, guys. We did get that first quarter GDP. I'll read here uh, a little bit of a deceleration here, 1.1%. We knew it was going to decelerate, but that was more than what the street was looking for. Economists had expected uh, about 1.9% growth here. But the bright spot there is consumer spending still holding up. The negative side of that, of course, is, well, inflation yep. is, is reflected in that quarterly PCE also holding up and, yeah. more importantly, reaccelerating. As we said, not easy being yeah. the Fed here, right? So growth slowing down, I inflation think they have still there. Easy job. What? I think they have a pretty easy job. <laughs> you go J do it then. <laughs> Jay Powell got pranked. This is not easy, but we'll talk about that a little bit later on. All right, so Are we? Romain. <laughs> Are we allowed to? <laughs> I don't know. Romain talked about the economic news. Earnings can be mixed as well. We see that play out in the trade and bank worries, right? We're watching First Republic a rally, but we're still wondering what the heck is next for that that one. Yeah. And on that, so banking still on our mind and some concerns. Barclays CEO catching up with our TV colleagues earlier today, CS Venkata Krishnan, he talked about, though, you got to put it in perspective, still maybe a crisis of some banks and not a bank crisis. I think the Credit Suisse was a very specific case. While I think Silicon Valley Bank was a specific case in terms of its circumstances, it has highlighted an issue with some of the regional banks in the U.S. And that we will see continuing to play out, maybe in a small number of names. And we've seen First Republic over the last couple of days. So I expect that we will see over a small number of names. It's not going to be systemic in any way. Uh, but there will be repercussions. All right, that, of course, is the CEO of Barclays earlier on Bloomberg. You know, so we want to hear it's not systemic, and it's good to hear it from a big bank uh, CEO. Having said that, too, look at uh, bank stocks. The KBW Bank Index today, Scarlett, some outperformance up about 2%, or at least keeping tabs or in check with what we're seeing in the broader trade. Yeah, but it worries me because there's no new news on First Republic. And the reporting that we got yesterday indicating that perhaps the, the Federal Reserve lending facilities may no longer be available to First Republic if regulators decide to change their assessment of the bank suggests just that there's still more to come. There's another shoe to drop at some point. This thing still needs to get resolved, and there's no path forward at the moment. Right. It's another one of those looming risks in the financial system. We've got the banking turmoil to the debt ceiling, right? Only losing four Republicans for McCarthy was sort of a win on that. But when I look at the debt ceiling debate and the uh, credit lending debate, it feels like those are two big risks that markets and the Fed are going to have to deal with. And you're starting to see uh, more and more money managers start to, start to talk about uh, how how you position around that potential risk. Remember, a lot of people were kind of brushing this off uh, just a few weeks ago, mm -hmm. saying, don't worry, it'll get resolved. It'll be at the last minute, to be sure. Now you're talking to people who are saying that, no, maybe they're not so sure. You know what I'm checking out? No. Check out Amazon. It's up almost 5% today. Why do we care? It's almost 3% what of the S&P, and it's yeah. about 67 of the NASDAQ 100. If we see some outperformance there, you do think about the impact that could have on the trade. Yeah. What? It always what? worries me to see those types of rallies heading in to that earnings report, because then it means the bar is now set high, and if, of course, if they disappoint, then you get that reversal, and then it just kind of, and well, then when fair. you have a waiting line. It's like a that. repricing of the AWS business uh, in the wake of Alphabet and Microsoft's cloud results, which were better than expected. So People are thinking, yes, there might be a, continue to be a slowdown in the cloud business over at Amazon, but maybe not as bad as uh, had been seen. But what, if, but what if some of that strength was at the expense of Amazon? I, I can't remember who it was, but when we, we were covering Microsoft, one of the analysts we spoke to kind of raised that, that issue, and that could be an issue for Microsoft, but this I mean, is, for Amazon. But it's one of the big players, right? Obviously, like well, yes, in the cloud well, space. And the other thing is you just talked about consumers holding up. There's that aspect of that, you know, their story as Did well. you see the MasterCard? Uh, numbers and just the kind of all the swipes and everything that's still going on. People right. are traveling. People yeah, are spending. People, people can't swiping. stop spending. We're addicted. Put the cards away. We yeah. all have enough stuff. Yeah. Put so, the cards so, away. so, but <laughs> do we have enough stuff? Thank, we do. Thank you. Thank you, Mom. <laughs> uh, so, uh, as we head into uh, the Fed meeting uh, on Tuesday, Carol, yeah. and I, I know we're going to meet in another hour here because we do this twice a day. That's just how much we love you. Yeah, it's like, yeah. you know, I don't know, a good workout. Do it twice a day, right? Um, Is this a workout? Does this work for you? <laughs> Sometimes. <laughs> All right, folks, we're going to be back in less than an hour's time. We're going to break down those Amazon Intel earnings and a few others. Join us at 4 p.m. Wall Street time for Beyond the Bell, our simulcast radio, TV, YouTube, and, of course, Bloomberg Originals.
earnings day losing. We just talked with Romaine. Uh, some good, some bad. Uh, today, investors seem pretty confident in the outlook at this point. Key economic data, growth slowing in the first quarter here in the U.S., uh, pullback in inventories, tepid business investment, uh, pickup in consumer spending. You had the Fed's preferred core gauge of prices. We want to get into that. Showed inflation. Yep, folks, it's still there. And then we had weekly jobless claims unexpectedly dropping. So I love this story in the Bloomberg about how the U.S. is in the worst of both worlds with high inflation and a growth slowdown. Let's get to it with Bloomberg News U.S. Economy reporter Reed Pickard on the phone in D.C. and Mike McKee, international economics and policy correspondent at Bloomberg News right here in our studio. Mike, how do we see it? I mean, first of all, you know what we really want to ask about? Was Jay Powell really pranked? <laughs> he apparently was really pranked. The Fed admits he was called by two Russians who pretended to be Vladimir Zelensky and uh, he talked to them for 15 or 20 minutes, I guess. Makes me not feel so bad when I, like, click on, you know, some phishing email and I, and I go to <laughs> oh, one place. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but I'm bummed. Um, let's get to the important stuff. What's key in today's reports? Well, it's it, two things I would point out. One, um, while the number was smaller than anticipated, we did see uh, growth in consumer spending. But the important thing about that is that most of that came in January. And uh, we did see a much lower growth rate in February. And we get the March numbers tomorrow, and the consensus of economists surveyed by Bloomberg is that it's going to show contraction. Mm -hmm. So we're showing weak consumer spending going into the second quarter. Businesses, we already saw, we, they dropped off 4% in the fourth quarter, 7 tenths of a percent gain in uh, the first quarter. So... Um, the spending may be an issue here, but the question is, is it temporary or not? Are uh, people going to come back and spend more money uh, starting in April? When you when you look at March, uh, Easter was late in April this year, so uh, economists and, and retailers will tell you you kind of have to combine the two months, so maybe we get a pop in early April, and that does seem to match the anecdotal evidence. Retail, uh, well, I mean, inventories in general, Mm -hmm. Fell, which is very unusual, 136 billion in inventories in the fourth quarter and negative 1.6 billion in the first quarter. So you assume there's going to be some inventory building, particularly if people are, are buying stuff, and that would add to growth in the second quarter. So the Fed is kind of in this dilemma of. Uh, is the economy really slowing, um, or uh, did it slow and maybe we're going to see a bit of a rebound? Um, there's no clear and convincing answer to the question of, are we in a recession, are we not, are we slowing enough to bring down inflation, are we not? Well, Reed, that perfectly tees up the headline of your story, U.S. in worst of both worlds with high inflation and the GDP slowdown, as Carol was saying earlier. Talk about why that is. Absolutely. So, you know, um, they, we, we really already hit on a lot of the main points here, but I, I would say that, you know, the, the point of this story and what we were trying to get across is that you have this situation where the economy is slowing, um, you know, as um, as we were talking about earlier, inventories lost off more than and, and made that number look a lot weaker than it actually was. Um, but still, you're still seeing this kind of slowdown in the economy at the same time that you're seeing, you know, inflation not only hold strong, but in, in some respects accelerate again um, and on a month over month basis. And so, you know, trying to parse that together and think about what the Fed has going forward, you've started to hear murmurs of people worrying about stall speed, worrying about kind of a stagflationary environment. Um, so it will be interesting to see how the, the Fed puts all of these pieces together, plus the wage data that we get out from the employment cost index or the kind of gauge of labor costs how all of those things come together with banking turmoil and and really kind of guide where the Fed is going from here. Right. We get that tomorrow, right? The, uh, employment, employment cost, cost index tomorrow. Are you yeah. yawning over there? No, I'm wide awake. <laughs> when, Reed <laughs> talks, when Reed talks, <laughs> I always listen. I know, you have, I know you have super long days. I'm just... <laughs> but well, it does... I, was, I, I, was, I, I love was, you, While, Mike. while you Reed was that. talking, I was reading Mike, uh, Matt Levine's column about um, First Republic. Oh. And they're in... Any key takeaways you, you want to share with you? Yes, the they are in huge trouble tomorrow. Yeah. Matt Levine's taking the day off. 
Oh. And every time he takes a day off, people know this as the Bloomberg Matt Levine curse, then big news happens. <laughs> and uh, so, and you know, if you're first so. Republic management, you're calling Matt Levine and going, we'll get you a car. <laughs> you know, anything. Call, come come into work. Come in. yeah. Please do something. Um, no, I'm kidding with you, but it does feel like this has been our world to some yeah. extent where there's just kind of this mixture of data and inflation kind of constantly persistent, even though it's come down. Is that yeah, it's, it's funny because you're, you're looking at the story that Reed put out today. It was just a little while ago that everybody was saying we're going into recession, and now we're going into stagflation. And before recession, it was the economy's too hot. <laughs> and so nobody right. quite knows what's going on. It's just a very unusual time because of the pandemic and the recovery is just so in fits and starts in different parts of the economy at different times. It's really hard to tell what's going to happen. And, you, you know, it's, it, it's tough to be sitting around the table at the Fed deciding what you're going to do. Yeah, and thanks, thank God to some extent. Go ahead, Reed, come on in. That, that oh, banks have calmed down a little bit, except for First Republic. Yeah, I would say one thing to add that's, that's kind of interesting to keep in mind when we're thinking about kind of the health of the consumer is I think they usually kind of talk about it in this, this realm of resilience. So, you know, even if this growth was concentrated in January, as long as consumers really, you know, keep holding up in the face of inflation, as long as we're not seeing kind of negative numbers when it comes to inflation-adjusted spending, that things will be okay. And I think, you know, the other thing to keep in mind is when the consumer is the engine of the economy and we're starting to see, you know, a, you know, a manufacturing sector that's clearly struggling, we're starting to see businesses start to pull back on investment. And, you know, a consumer that's just holding up is not enough to keep the economy from contracting because you really need that thrust there. You, you need them to not stall out. So it'll be interesting not only to see, you know, if the loss of momentum that we're seeing, mm -hmm. if it's temporary, but they, they, they really need to speed back up again, which is a an, an kind of an entirely different um, chore to tackle as well. But two things. One, the, the residential uh investment uh, was down double digits for the last three quarters and then in the first quarter it was down just four percent basically and so maybe we're seeing a bottom in housing which would help mm. the economy overall because you don't just buy houses you buy the furniture and things that go in it so that's something to keep an eye on it isn't a, a complete turnaround but it is uh, maybe something to hang the idea of the economy skating through on. And the other is jobless claims. Um, yeah. I can't tell you why they fell by, uh, you know, uh, 16,000 last yeah. week when they had been uh, rising some somewhat. And we're still getting all these layoff announcements. Right. Um, and you wonder how, much, how many of them are actually people getting fired and how many of them are just jobs that aren't going to be filled. Um, so as long as the economy is, uh, the labor market rather, is holding up, then consumer spending can hold up. And we should see tomorrow a rise in wages in the ECI because it's the first quarter and, you know, it's, it'll be seasonally adjusted. But it's like when, when we get raises and the minimum uh, raise, uh, wage goes up the first of the year, also we had the big Social Security cola gain. So people had more money in January. I just want to ask both of you real quickly, Reed, you first. You know, it, it does feel like we could technically, what, get a recession, but as Mike was talking you know, about some of the strength in the, the labor market, I mean, could we have that recession with a labor market that is still kind of tight? I, I mean, I really think it's possible. I mean, from the, it's, you know, a, a jobless recession is certainly something that uh, we, we haven't uh, really experienced recently, if, if ever at all, but... You know, I think you do need to see some degree to which unemployment rises for it to be considered a recession. Um, that was kind of the difference between what we saw at the beginning of last year, where we saw two straight, you know, quarters of contraction, but that labor market remained so firm. And so, right. you know, you do need to see some weakening there, um, but it doesn't have to be the, the, the level of job losses that I think a lot of Americans have been primed to of the pandemic or the great financial crisis. Um, it can definitely be much less than that. Mike, I know I ask you all the time, like, can we have this jobless recession? Um, we can. Have uh, we had one? Not in the same sense. We've had uh, 
recession. The, the recovery from the great financial crisis was unusual because we didn't have huge job gains that suggested we we're coming in a V out of a mm -hmm. re recovery, but we had 100 to 200,000 for years, month after month after month. So things that haven't happened really before can happen. Uh, we just don't know uh, yeah. because just we don't have anything to compare it with this time. Can't wait for the Fed meeting. Almost there. Well, I'm just waiting to see if Matt Levine gets through the weekend without having to come in. If that's, if that's the case, we'll all feel Matt better on Monday. Uber. Could you come in and do another column? <laughs> Michael McKee, International Economics and Policy Correspondent. Reed Picker, U.S. Economy Reporter out there in D.C. This is Bloomberg Radio. Headlines and breaking news 24 hours a day at Bloomberg.com, on Bloomberg Television, and the Bloomberg Business App. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. 
It's 321 on Wall Street. We check markets all day long here at Bloomberg. Stocks at or near session highs. 38 minutes to go ahead of the closing bell. The Dow, the S&P, NASDAQ solidly in the green. Right to the numbers. S&P up 82. That is a gain right now of 2%. The Dow up 549 points. An advance of 1.6%. NASDAQ up 298 points. Up now by 2.5%. Stocks up the most since January. Treasury are retreating after solid earnings from tech companies blotted out the impact of a report this morning showing slowing economic growth and higher than forecast inflation. Meta Platforms is surging 14.6 percent after last night's earnings report. After the close of trading today, we will be hearing from Amazon. That's stock up now by 4.7 percent. We've got the 10-year yielding 3.52 percent, the two-year 4.08 percent. Gold little changed, up now by 50 cents the ounce to 1989 crude up seven tenths of one percent 74.85 a barrel there are just not enough people to repossess all the motorcycles that was the message from harley davidson which says its credit losses in the first quarter were due in part to a shortage of repossession agents shares of harley they're down now by one percent and that is a bloomberg business flash all right charlie thank you so much a lot going on folks as you know we are all in on semis today uh intel reporting its earnings after the closing bell kla did yesterday it is rallying wolf speed did as well it's getting hammered uh, as you know not all semi com companies do the same thing we know that they play in different parts of the market um and some are bellwethers or at least we think of them as uh who keeps track of it all the cycles and the jockeying for position among the competitors is our own Bloomberg News U.S. Semiconductor and Networking Reporter Ian King, who is on the phone in our San Francisco Bureau. He also draws our attention to one specific player over in Europe. It is our Bloomberg Big Take today. Uh, it's about the European semi company that is really defining the global chip war. So we've got a lot to get to. Um, Ian, thank you for, for being with us. Uh, we love talking semis. It's such a great indicator of kind of what's going on more broadly in the world. Can we start with um, the earnings we've got so far? KLA, Wolf Speed, we've got Intel tonight. How are you thinking about them individually or more broadly? Well, I think the way to look at it is that anything related to the PC market, uh, which would be Intel, as, as we'll get in sort of half an hour's time, has been really rough. We've seen Micron, we've seen Samsung Electronics putting out some really ugly numbers, and the expectation is that Intel will unfortunately be in a position where it has to do the same. The question then remains, well, is this the bottom point? Is this the low point for the market? Samsung and Micron sort of indicated maybe it isn't, maybe it's worse than we thought, and you know, people will be really, really looking closely at what Intel says to see if uh, if it can offer any hope at all for that for that very important market. Is this a cyclical issue, or is it a fundamental consumer demand shift when it comes to what we're hearing in these earnings? Well, that, that's a question that if I if I knew the answer to that, uh, <laughs> you'd be living yeah, on no, an you, island in the Caribbean. I think wouldn't you know you? everything, Ian. No, you, you, I mean you, you've nailed it. I mean the the, <laughs> the, the 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 key point here is that you know they've talked about look, we need to get rid of this inventory that we've accumulated. As soon as that's gone, everything will be okay. But those who are, are less uh, enthusiastic about things are saying, look, you know, get rid of as much inventory as you like. But if demand isn't there, then how does that help us? And and the big question is, are we going back to pre-pandemic levels for the PC industry, or are we going to have this kind of rosy scenario where we need more PCs in the world? Um, right now, it looks like we're going back to the pre-pandemic levels at best. But there are different companies, as you always remind us, Ian, that play into the automotive or industrial spaces. Obviously, the PC spaces we're just talking about. Everybody's been like, you know, nuts about art artificial intelligence, and we've seen Nvidia certainly uh, get good results as a result of that, or at least their share price. So, how are there sectors that you think, you know, are really just set for some outperformance, and those like the PC sector that are not? Yeah, I mean, obviously. PC is, is fairly negative. I think what we've seen from this earnings season, and, and hopefully I think Amazon will reflect that, is that this frenzy in AI, or whatever you want to call it, is is means that the big data center guys, the, the Amazon AWS, is the Metas, the Googles, uh, need to keep spending. And if they need to keep spending, then they're going to be buying NVIDIA chips. They're mm -hmm. going to be buying AMD chips. And that's 
a good balance to what's going on in the PC market. That's kind of the bright spot. In terms of what's going on elsewhere, the concern is industrial, which has been a kind of a strong point for a lot of these companies like TI, is actually starting to fade away and demand for sort of factory equipment related semiconductors is actually fading. All right, so let's go to the Bloomberg Big Take story because I think this is really important. It's not necessarily always the chip company that we talk about. I'm sure you do because this is your world, but ASML, uh, it is the Bloomberg Big Take. You talk about it defining the global chip war. Talk to us a little bit about this name and why it's important for us to watch. Yeah, it's, it's important for a, a number of reasons. I mean, if you're just into investing in companies that are doing very well, it, it has a monopoly, right? It does. It, it produces something that is incredibly difficult. Other companies like Nikon names of companies that you've heard of tried to do this and failed. Everybody needs an ASML um, <clears throat> machine, whether they know it or not. And it's sold out for the next couple of years at least. Um, because it's so important, because you need this company's equipment to make some of the most advanced semiconductors for things like AI, for things like weapons, um, governments have noticed. And if you don't want China to develop those capabilities, then this makes this company a very obvious and easy choke point. Is the geopolitical tension between China and the U.S. a potential headwind for ASML? Yeah, no, that, that's absolutely the concern. They're already not allowed to ship some of their most um, advanced technology to China, and there's no sense that when they bring out these new machines that they'll be allowed to, to send those to China. Right now, ASML kind of shrugs this off and says, look, I don't know what you're worried about. Everybody in the world needs one of these machines. We've got more orders than we can deal with. Calm down. And that's the essential tension. Long term, though, there is this concern that because we put China in this corner and, and, and stop giving them our best stuff, that they'll do it themselves. You do wonder, I love some of the quotes in this story about just how important this, as you note, you know, this company is particularly to everything in our world. And, and so I just wonder, you know, how does it make its, how does it take, make its way forward? And I think about, you know, the guy who heads up the company that you write about, you know, what he's thinking and how he navigates through this. Yeah, I mean, his answer is a little bit rote, but it's, it's yeah. also, in this case, very true, which is, look, we, we can't litigate what's going on in the minds of politicians around the world. What we can do is keep pushing forward this extreme amount of, of science that we've managed to focus and bring into a practical use case. The biggest hurdle there is, well, the science is getting so extreme. I mean, you're talking about layers on these semiconductors that are multiple layers of of, of materials that get deposited and then scraped off, a, 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 you know, a single mm -hmm. atom thick, you can't go thinner than a single atom. So maybe we are reaching the, the kind of Star Trek limit of what the technology is capable of and the physics will allow. Hey, one thing I wanted to ask you, Ian, and I keep thinking about this. I thought about it yesterday, you know, when we talk about Boeing or we talk about Airbus, uh, you know, what China is doing on that front, right? They are trying to go more high tech. They're trying to build up their own domestic industries. Where is, you know, we know of TSMC, but what about a Chinese competitor or trying to do something that ASML is doing? Yeah, that's a, that's a very good question, um, particularly if you think about some of the multiple billions, if not hundreds of billions of dollars that China has allocated towards this. Simple answer is it hasn't worked. Mm -hmm. It hasn't worked because they didn't invest in the fundamentals. They invested in quick solutions with a lot of waste of money, and, and, and they're nowhere. And now, unfortunately, the, the, the reality for, for China is that they're getting cut off from this Western technology, so their ability to play catch-up, even in production, is being constrained, and this is a difficult situation for them that may take many years if they do it themselves to catch up. And I keep thinking about this cycle, right, because China still makes a lot of stuff that we all use, and if they're banned from tapping into a company like this, you know, ultimately, we're going to feel the pain potentially as well. Well, from a Chinese perspective, they want to do it themselves. They don't want to be massive importers of Western technology. They don't want to be just a lower rung in the food chain mm -hmm. that, that could be cut off at any moment. Um, from a Western perspective, it's all been about costs, and China has been you know, a low-cost part of things. So that does bring the potential, if we're going to have this decoupling, that the price of things will go up. Hey, Ian, really quickly here, we've got like 30 seconds. Uh, the CHIPS Act, any potential issues for ASML on that? Um, no, I mean, you know, 
the more people are spending on factories, the better for them. Yeah. So it's right. it's a boost. It's, it should be. It should help them in the in the in the medium term. And just last 30, 40 seconds out. It is pretty remarkable, ASML, as you write in your story that you know where this company is today versus where it was a few decades ago. Yeah, I mean, everybody's heard of Nikon, everyone's heard of Canon, and everyone's familiar with Japan's, you know, abilities in, in precision engineering. Um, this company took them on and won. It's pretty remarkable. Um, I know it's a busy day for you. you got Intel earnings, you got other stuff, um, but thank you for jumping on board and uh, spending some time with us. Ian King, uh, so appreciate it. Ian, of course, as we say, and because it's the truth, <laughs> keeps track of everything that's going on in the semi space. And this story on ASML, um, which is, by the way, up about 3.4% in today's session, just looking at the trade here, and it's up about 15% so far this year. Um, you know, just is a deep dive to really make you understand the differences between the players, uh, and especially this one in terms of uh, the critical role it plays globally. Uh, you know, the more manufacturing of semis, this is a company that benefits. Um, Ian, thank you again so much. You are listening and watching Bloomberg Business Week. Carol Master along with Madison Mills. Let's head uh, back for another update on World of National News. We've got Nancy Lyons in our 991 newsroom in D.C. Hey, Nance. Thanks, Carol. The Biden administration is making moves to handle asylum seekers after pandemic-era restrictions end May 11th. Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas says they'll open migration centers in Guatemala and Colombia for those heading to the U.S.-Mexico border. The whole model is to reach the people where they are, to cut the smugglers out, and to have them avoid the perilous journey that too many do not make. Mayorkas says additional centers could be announced in the coming weeks. Congressional Republicans have other ideas. They are advancing a measure that would restart wall construction across the southern border and add border patrol agents. NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg says the alliance has provided Ukraine with hundreds of combat vehicles and tanks that were promised by the contact group. More than 98 percent of the combat vehicles promised to Ukraine have already been uh, delivered. That means over 1,550 armored vehicles, 230 tanks and other equipment, including uh, vast amounts of ammunition. Stoltenberg says the equipment will provide Ukraine a bigger punch as it moves to launch a counteroffensive. Russia says its decision to reject a request by the U.S. Embassy in Moscow to visit jailed Wall Street Journal reporter Evan Gershkovich was a retaliatory move. Russia is upset the U.S. failed to issue visas to its journalists for Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov's visit to New York. The first round of the NFL draft takes place tonight in Kansas City. The Carolina Panthers traded up for the top pick, and they are expected to select a quarterback. Global News, 24 hours a day, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Nancy Lyons. This is Bloomberg.
sports, headlines, and breaking news 24 hours a day at Bloomberg.com, on Bloomberg Television, and the Bloomberg Business app. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. It's 3.40 on Wall Street. We do check markets all day long. Stocks holding near session highs. Lots of moving parts today. Earnings, the economy. Let's head right over to the first word breaking news desk for today's afternoon call. Here he is, Bill Maloney. And good afternoon, Charlie. U.S. stocks in the green from the start, helped by a 15% gain in Facebook after earnings. Dow's currently up 513 points. SB's gained 78 and NASDAQ is higher by 2.4%. The U.S. 10 yield at 3.53%. Gold is little change. Oil trading in the green. And Bitcoin is higher by 4.3%. Of the main 11 SP sectors, all were trading in the green, led by gains in telecom and consumer discretionary. And leaders to the upside in the Dow, Verizon, Honeywell, and Disney, while Caterpillar fell after earnings and led to the downside. Also after earnings, Abbey fell 7%, while Hasbro gained 14%. In other news, First Republic Bank gained 8%, while MasterCard said the DOJ is probing its debit practices. Wrapping things up, Intel and Amazon report after the bell. Live from the First of Breaking News Desk, I'm Bill Maloney. Charlie. Okay, thank you very much, Bill Maloney. Amazon Thursday will be all over those numbers as they break. And to hear live breaking news over your Bloomberg, type Squawk, S-Q-U-A, on your Bloomberg terminal. I'm Charlie Pellet, and that is a Bloomberg Business Flash. I'm driving in my car, I turn on the radio. Yeah, how about you let me drive? Oh, no, 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 no. Who's gonna drive you home? Honey, please, I'll do the driving. Drive on. Excuse me, I want to drive. It's the question that drives us. This is the drive to the close. That punk music will drive us to kill the dawn. On Bloomberg Radio. All right, everybody, we have just under 18 minutes left in today's trading session, getting ready to wrap up the Thursday trade. We've got big earnings coming, as Charlie mentioned, Amazon, Intel, a few others after the close. Holding on to gains, though, on the equity side of things. So let's get to it. Our drive to the close guest on this Thursday is Shanil Ramji, Senior Investment Manager at Pictay Asset Management here in our Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio with Maddie and myself. Um, nice to have you here. How are you? Yeah, very good. Thanks for having me. Nice to be in New York. Yeah. Oh, good. Where are you? You're typically based in London. In London. Yeah. All right. So tell me, mood difference between London and here. Well, firstly, the weather is not as good in London. Let me tell you that much. <laughs> but uh, no, it's like it's lovely to be back in New York. I haven't been back for several years, and the buzz is great. It does feel like the energy. Um, when you're in London, though, what is the what is the conversation you think most? that you guys talk about at work versus like when you come over to the U.S. and you're talking to different clients, is it a little bit different? Is it the same stuff? Yeah, in the, in the U.S. it's typically quite U.S. focused. You know, we have a much global, much more global view in London and uh, it's always the U.S. versus the rest, right? Where When are we going to see performance come through from the rest of the world? And we do see uh, that coming to the fore this year in, in some ways. Uh, with European indices doing quite well this year, um, and uh, the reopening of China really starting to drive some investment decisions. So coming coming to the yes this week, I think this is uh, what people have been asking about. Are you monitoring every single potential data point that could impact the Fed's moves as much as we are here? You'd be surprised that in Europe we we care a lot about that too, right? So we we are uh, you know watching each and every uh, statement also, but we try and trying to have that more applicable to what's going on elsewhere. What is the ECB? What is the BOE? What is the BOJ? What is the Chinese? Uh, yeah, so how, how are they responding to what the Fed is doing? But, you know, the, the Fed is still the, the, big, the big guy in the room, and we really need to know what uh, Jay Powell and, and co. are going to do. Well, so having said that, you do take a global perspective. And um, lucky for us, you've shared some notes with our producers. So we know that you do like non-U.S. equities more than you like U.S. equities, from what I understand. Make that case. So at the moment, we know that the valuations in the U.S. are quite high. If we think S&P 500 is about 18 times. Uh, when we look elsewhere around the world, we think you're looking at much lower valuations, 12 times in Europe, 10 times in the U.K., much lower in, uh, in parts of Asia. So we can say for an evaluation case that this is interesting, but we know that the rest of the world has always been cheaper in general. So Correct. why now? Why do we think now? So... 
firstly, the, we think there's a desynchronization in the global economy. We see the U.S. economy is slowing. We saw today's GDP number uh, a bit slower, a bit more inflation. Um, and when we look at the rest of the world, having had the big energy scare that we saw uh, at the end of the last year in Europe and thinking that we were going to have a big recession in Europe first quarter this year, that didn't materialize. And we're getting a cyclical upswing in Europe, but that's also aided by the fact that China reopened, right? So the China reopening has helped um, look at non-US growth being a little bit better than US growth, and that's turning into some positives for earnings, not just in China, but elsewhere. There's Europe, and you know, Europe's a pretty big uh, area, region. Um, what specifically? Are there certain markets? Are there certain types of industries, certain companies? Absolutely. So in Europe, we really like the consumer sectors, the consumer cyclicals. But really, in a world where we know that there's this inflation pressure, we think the high-end consumer is doing the best, right? The affluent consumer has, mm -hmm. uh, has the ability to spend more. So when we look at those premium brands, when we look at those luxury companies, they continue to grow their, their revenue base. They are interesting companies in the sense that... So like your LVMHs. Absolutely. Um, LVMH is the... Is the the, the LVMH, for example, uh, encompasses all those luxury brands, and we think there, there are many of them in Europe, and that's what Europe does best. You know, we know that those are, the, are some of the best companies in Europe are those uh, those luxury companies. Sorry, U.S. luxury brands. We <laughs> love you, even <laughs> if uh, Chanel does it. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Yeah, no, I mean, it's... No, but um, I know what you're saying, and we've talked about that. We've done a lot of reporting that uh, as these results come in, uh, the luxury names have really been outperforming, and we are talking about the China reopening yeah. as one of the reasons. But U.S. shoppers are buying, too, certainly U.S. high-end shoppers. Absolutely. Yeah, why do you think that U.S. high-end shoppers are more susceptible to headwinds than... European high-end shoppers. I think the U.S. high the U.S. high-end consumer is also going to be quite resilient. We've seen the numbers today on the consumption being still quite strong, right? So we know that the the consumer in the U.S. is, is has been good. And um, those are January numbers, as our Mike McKee reminded us. And we'll get March, I think, tomorrow. So yeah. it was kind of before the banking, exactly. you know, kind of meltdown of a few names. So it'll be interesting to see if it continues to hold up. But even if we look at travel, for example, travel and leisure, uh, when we look at the hotel, hotel uh, mm -hmm. chain numbers, when we look at the airline numbers, these numbers have been pretty good. So we know that the consumers are spending on what they hold dear, and right now they, what they hold dear is some, some of those luxury brands and also the travel and leisure that they, that they care about most. Chanel, how much would you suggest for an investor to have of their portfolio with non-U.S. exposure at this point? At the moment, just in the, that luxury consumer discretionary area, uh, the portfolio that we build for clients has about 5% in those areas. And we think that that's just because the consumer is the driver right now in the global economy. We do think, however, that uh, that will slow over time. And what we see in that desynchronization that I mentioned is also desynchronization in the sectors of the economy that are working. And one of those sectors that we think could have some better performance in the second half of the year yeah. is the more manufacturing or industrial sector. And we are seeing some of those numbers come for, out. For over in Europe or more broadly? More, more broadly, more mm -hmm. globally. And I think the European story in terms of the industrials, we see earning revisions pick up. And that's partly due to some of the fiscal stimulus that we see around some of the environmental spend that's going on. We look at the, either the IRA or what the mm -hmm. similar policies in Europe. These are spending that governments are doing that are going to benefit some of these industrial companies, and their order, order books are already uh, showing that. But a lot of consumer discretionary companies in the U.S. are having amazing earnings. I'm thinking about McDonald's, Pepsi, so maybe not just the high-end shoppers. And they're global names. Yeah. Absolutely. So just when, got about 30 seconds left. <laughs> when, when we look at those, uh, those global um, U.S. companies, they're, they have been having good numbers. And, for example, I think uh, Coca-Cola said some of their coffee shops in China were really showing positive earnings. So, you know, you know, you know it's open when people are going out to coffee shops. Um, so, you know, these are the, some of the data that we look at. So it's not just European companies. Right. You are right. It is, it is also uh, American companies, but we think 
the consumer generally is the place to be. All right, that uh, we certainly see that, and as you said, higher end in particular. Um, Shanil, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Shanil Ramji, he's Senior Investment Manager at Pictay Asset Management, joining us here in our Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio. We're coming up on 10 minutes uh, before the bell rings on Wall Street and equities holding on to their gains. This is Bloomberg. Company news headlines on Bloomberg Radio. From Bloomberg World Headquarters, I'm Charlie Pellet. We are minutes away from the latest numbers out of Amazon.com against the backdrop of better than expected tech earnings overall. One focus for Amazon will be the cloud with Amazon Web Services. Anurag Rana is with Bloomberg Intelligence. One way you can save cost, if you are a company, if you are Bank of America, if you are JP Morgan, one way you can save money on technology cost is to dial back the usage of your cloud resources, which means you don't have to use as much. And since Amazon charges pay per use, you can reduce your cost, which is not a good thing for Amazon, but a great thing for clients. And Amazon shares surging now by 4.7%. Meta Platforms after earnings holding on to its gains today up now by 13.9%. MasterCard said spending growth on its cards accelerated in the first three months of the year as the payment giant continues to benefit from a rebound in travel. With that story, here's Bloomberg's Denise Pellegrini. Charlie, total purchase volume jumped 17% to $1.71 trillion in the first quarter. And that tops the $1.65 trillion average 
coverage of analyst estimates compiled by Bloomberg. It helped boost net revenue to $5.7 billion, and that also topped estimates. MasterCard and Rival Visa, well, they have both benefited as consumers free from the pandemic-era restrictions, resume travel, and, of course, also dining out. Now, earlier this week, Visa said cross-border volume, a key metric, because such transactions are typically more lucrative than those domestic payments. Well, they surged 24 percent in the first three months of the year, Charlie. And those are our corporate stories. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Business Week with Carol Masser and Tim Stenebeck on Bloomberg Radio. All right, everybody, just about four and a half minutes left in today's uh, trading day. We're getting ready to wrap up the Thursday trade. Uh, some big ones, as you know, Amazon, Intel, after the closing bell, a few others that will be breaking down. In the meantime, um, cute story we thought we would bring you. Uh, has a few uh, celebrities in uh, the headline, Tom Brady, Steph Curry, a few others. Uh, being sued for promoting FTX before its collapse. Uh, want to temporarily halt burdensome discovery while efforts to dismiss the suit are pending. What? Yeah, I mean, the FTX story is an embarrassment of riches when it comes to <laughs> narratives. Uh, but I'm just going to point out, this is um, not our Bloomberg reporting, but we do know that Taylor Swift was advised to ask some questions. Was and that not she a was great able story? to Go. sidestep the FTX lawsuit. I, I just had to mention that the Bloomberg story is about Tom Brady, Steph Curry. Uh, they did not ask those questions. Didn't so. she um, ask, um, are they regulated? Or they? She asked this really great She said, can can you okay. tell me that these are not unregistered securities? That's it. Yeah, yeah. For and FTX. they couldn't tell her that, so she avoided the lawsuit. I, I, I am full she disclosure, shook it guys. Off. She Taylor shook Swift it fan. off, baby. Nice. Uh, I don't well know. Well done, I was, Carol Masser. Thank, thank you. You're just kind. I was trying to think of That's it. why <laughs> she's got a great show here at Bloomberg. Works. No, it's because I Best get to play with people there. like you. Um, but the group, which also includes uh, Tom's wife, former wife, oops, uh, Giselle <laughs> Bunchen, uh, Bunchen, I never say that right, and Shark Tank host Kevin O'Leary needlessly, was needlessly dragged into this case in search of deep pockets, lawyers said, in a Wednesday filing and the U.S. District Court for the Southern District of Florida. Wah, wah. You I'm know, sorry. do the celebrities ever, do we Come think on. that they have a bad outcome here? I don't know that they do. Come you know? on. Come I mean, on, man. celebrities. Are they liable for their losses? I mean, listen, everybody gets it their day in court. I get that. Yeah. Um, but it's, it is interesting when celebrities endorse things. And we've seen people come under fire and some penalties, right, of stuff on social if they're touting something and maybe some things yeah, go astray. Yeah, no, it's true. So you do think about what's the responsibility of somebody who endorses something. I'm sure there's things in contracts. Yeah. I don't know. Um, but I do wonder. I do wonder. Carol, you know what else I'm wondering is what? uh, what's going to happen with these earnings coming up in about 20 seconds here when we join our simulcast. Amazon. We've got Amazon, Intel, Pinterest, Snap, T-Mobile. I mean, it's a big day. It's a big day. And it's a big day for the bullish investor, Chris man, We've had quite a rally, broad-based, and we're holding on to our gains. All right. Right now to head over to our TV team, Beyond the Bell starts now. Else. Move her closing to these closing bells. Full market coverage right here on Bloomberg as we take you to the bell and beyond. Beyond the Bell, Bloomberg's comprehensive cross-platform coverage of the U.S. market close starts right now. And right now we are two minutes away from the end of the trading day. Romain Bostic alongside Scarlett Fu counting you down to the closing bell. Here to help take us beyond the bell, a global simulcast with Carol Masser and Madison Mills. Welcome to our audiences across Bloomberg Television, Bloomberg Radio, Bloomberg Originals, and those folks streaming us on YouTube. Uh, we haven't really had a day in quite a few weeks where I think the market can really cheer in a broad-based manner. They're getting that today, Carol, with all of the major indices up uh, 1% to 2% on the day. Yeah, really all in, and I'm looking at the major industry groups. I know we're going to get into them later, but everything is up, and in some really, really strong gains in today's session. So this broad-based rally really a standout based upon like some of the trade that we've had over the last couple of weeks, Maddie. Yeah, I love the way that our Scarlet Foo said it earlier, that it's just a pesto pizza <laughs> of green on the screen. Did I think that's really I think that? that's an MBA level comment, Scarlet. <laughs> or spinach quiche, whichever you prefer. Of course, yeah, let's, let's keep it a uh, lot of options there. But it really is, it's interesting to see kind of a more bullish day. 
Yeah, we're looking at the S&P, Dow, and NASDAQ all up at least 1.9%. With the S&P, the laggard here, Romain, um, the NASDAQ really the, the star performer uh, following the meta earnings, which kind of changed the way people were thinking. And as Tom Kennedy was just telling us, uh, perhaps investors are testing out the idea that the worst of what we've seen with tech has passed us by. Yeah, and I just want to point out, I was just kind of looking uh, through uh, some of the numbers here. Uh, I mean, if we close at these levels, and it looks like we are here, uh, the S&P actually now uh, raising all of its losses for the month of April here with mm -hmm. only uh, one trading day left here uh, in the month, if I remember correctly right, Friday is tomorrow yes. here. So uh, this is a pretty significant move, not just in terms of the percentage move, but I think on a psychological level uh, to see uh, these types of moves. We're getting the closing and the clapping uh, of uh, the bells at the NYSE and the NASDAQ. And if my eyes don't deceive me, you squint really hard there at the NYSE. You see our very own Gina Martin-Adams no helping to ring the closing bell what? on the NYSE. Yes, this That's is part so cool. uh, of the CMT Association, of course, uh, charter uh, market technicians here celebrating their 50th uh, anniversary. Of course, this kind of started out as really just an informal gathering back in the 60s. They incorporated in 1973. There, and there you is. see Gina Martin Adams, uh, one of the Go smartest people Gina. we have walking around the building here at Bloomberg World Headquarters now down uh, ringing the bell at the NYSE. And what a day for her to ring, ring the bell. The Dow Jones Industrial Average higher by 1.6 percent. The S&P 500 having its best day since early January up one point. We'll call it rounded up to 2 percent. The Nasdaq composite up 2.5 percent. And the Russell 2000 going to close higher by 1.2 percent. All right. So let's get to it, uh, folks, as we await those results from Amazon. Uh, you had most names in the S&P 500, as we've been saying, broad-based. Scarlett, uh, 444 names uh, gaining ground today, 59 to the downside. So, yeah, investors all in. Investors all in. And of of course, you look at the sector performances on a 24 industry group basis, everything is green. Uh, oh, look, Amazon numbers just came out. Uh, Romain, let's take a look. Uh, we've got first quarter Amazon. EPS of 31 cents. Net sales also beating the consensus estimate 127 versus the estimated 124. Yeah, let's go through these numbers uh, right now here. We talk about what looks to be a bit uh, interesting beat here, at least on that main number here. Let's go through some of the operating numbers, because on a margin basis, you did see widening in the margins, which is what a lot of people were hoping to see, 3.7% uh, versus a street uh, estimate of about 2.3% here. We talk about uh, the actual guidance going forward here. Uh, for 2Q, they're looking at net sales of 127 to 133. Uh, the street was looking, on average, for about $130 billion. So it looks like on the top end, they're definitely going to come in above that. Operating income for the second quarter, though, uh, the pretty wide range that they're giving, $2 billion to $5.5 billion. The street, on average, was looking for four point seven, so a wide range that I guess gives them a lot of wiggle room for a beat or a miss, but the top end of that uh, higher uh, than the average of analyst estimates here. Uh, it looks like uh, the initial reaction here, guys, uh, is to the upside. I'm going to dive a little bit deeper into these numbers. we got other earnings crossing the wire right now, including Intel. Yeah, let's take a look at Intel. Uh, second quarter outlook because it's all about what it sees going forward and uh, revenue eleven and a half billion dollars to twelve and a half billion analysts were looking for eleven point seven five billion so certainly uh, giving a top end of the range that does beat the consensus estimate as for the quarter that ended first quarter data center and AI revenue also coming in higher than anticipated the stock gaining about four and a half percent right now but still Intel did report a loss for the quarter it's an adjusted loss of four cents per share which is actually wider than the expected two cent uh, loss per share that analysts had been looking for. The sharp decline in PC sales, also falling data center demand and increased competition from other chip makers like AMD and ARM are the big drivers behind that uh, sales drop in terms of the direction from a year ago and the loss for the quarter. I want to go to T-Mobile earnings here, reporting postpaid net customers for the first quarter that did beat the average analyst estimate. Uh, earnings per share coming in at $1.58 versus uh, the estimate, which was $1.48, according to the Bloomberg consensus there. We've got revenue at uh, over $19 billion here, uh, coming in a little lower than estimates there. The total net customers were also a bit of a beat. Uh, we've got $1.32 million. The estimate was $1.2 million on that. Uh, and I'm just going to take a look at the stock price really quickly. Looks like it's going up a little bit uh, here. Uh, yeah, we've got up 1.37% on that news. Again, uh, yeah. beating those EPS estimates Let's there. go back to the big one, Amazon, right? Because it's such a player on cloud, on advertising, also on the consumer. So Amazon beating on first quarter revenue. Shares are shooting up. Uh, we're showing these results. Uh, I'm looking at our Spencer Soper on our live blog that they can keep growing sales at a healthy pace. So on the top line, it's a beat across the 
board for Amazon, and I'm looking into the press release. They're talking about their advertising business because on a three-year basis, this has really been the star performer in terms of growth. They're talking about their ad business continuing to deliver robust growth, largely due to an ongoing machine learning investments that help customers see relevant information. So we see that play uh, in terms of data. AWS business navigating companies spending more cautiously in this macro environment. We continue to prioritize building long-term customer relationships. So some cautiousness, if you will, when it comes to cloud there. The cautious is here, but the growth was still there. We yep. haven't actually gone through some of the actual uh, numbers on an individual basis as far as we go through those individual businesses here. But that big drop off that everybody was looking in the, looking for in the cloud business, it really didn't materialize. I know some of those estimates had come down, so maybe the bar was a little bit lower, but you still had that 16% growth in AWS, $21 billion in revenue. You still had that 18% growth in the third party seller service, $30 billion in revenue coming there for the company here. And even when it comes to uh, just uh, the overall business model and the growth that they're getting here, you're talking about a business that is held up. So where is that worst case scenario? Well, there's a lot of concern that uh, spending on the cloud would continue to slow, and it has been slowing for a couple of quarters. But let's keep in mind that sales growth in AWS is still at double-digit growth. And in fact, with the results from Microsoft and Alphabet earlier this week, people were thinking, wait a minute, maybe we've gotten a little too bearish on expecting this slowdown to come in at AWS. Maybe we can uh, mentally ratchet it higher. And Amazon has delivered here, over-delivered on the cloud side, which is kind of what Alphabet and Microsoft set us up for. And AWS is important, guys, because yeah. it makes up the majority of Amazon's operating income. I absolutely, do. absolutely. Let's get to Mondelez, a different type of uh, earnings release here, certainly a different type of company. But this company also beating, it looks like, on the top and bottom line. First quarter net revenue, $9.17 billion versus an estimate of $8.47 billion. First quarter adjusted EPS, $0.89. Cents. That's $0.09 cents better than the street was expecting. And you also have the operating margin coming in above estimates, 17.2%, 16.5 was the estimate, so uh, definitely a beat there, and you're seeing Mondelez uh, trade a little bit higher. Let's get to Pinterest, also out with their results, so a read certainly on the advertising and social space. They are reporting a first quarter adjusted EPS of eight cents. The estimate was for a 0.3 cent loss. I want to check on that number, so it does look like a little bit of a beat. First quarter revenue, 602.6 million. That definitely is a beat. The estimate was for 592.8 million. The stock, though, is trending lower here, down more than 3%. And uh, first quarter revenue, that is, though, a beat here, but not enough to impress investors, Maddie. That stock down about 8% in the aftermarket. Yeah, I just want to go back to Amazon really quickly, though, because uh, these earnings beats across the board here are also showing a beat at uh, physical store sales uh, heading through to online. The North American net sales and subscription services all beats there. So along with Mondelez, that's kind of two uh, boons for consumer spending that we're seeing, Romaine. So what's the next step here when we talk about sort of the guidance going forward and whether this sustains itself deeper into the year? Does this become one about the business spending uh, and particularly how it ties to AWS or is it more about consumer spending? Feels like it's got to be both, right? I, I agree. I agree. I think what's interesting is that we were so looking forward to this week. These are the the names that really move the market. We've seen it, right? We've talked about the, you know, overperformance, if you will, or the, you know, over, um, you know, play that in terms of the overall trade here, if you will. I'm not getting my words out here. But my point is these are big companies. They move the markets. They do a lot for all of us at work and play. You name it. And they are really performing here. And, and they're giving some upbeat guidance and that's a strong indicator. I'm really curious, and this is something that comes up in Bloomberg's uh, top live blog here where we track all the earnings, on what Amazon or how Amazon is going to frame AI because it's been such a big theme for these big tech companies. You can't not talk about it. How does that play into its various initiatives, whether it's uh, the web services, the cloud business, or whether it's on the retail side, certainly where you already kind of see it in action with all the recommendations that they're constantly pushing in your face? Well, they did de definitely talk about the importance of data when it comes to advertising on the press release, but we'll look for some more when it comes to AI, which it seems to be we've all got to talk about AI, yeah. uh, and certainly these players. Our right, guys, um, a lot of earnings after the closing bell, and we're seeing stocks move Amazon in a big way, and so we'll certainly track that into the Friday trade. All right, that's a wrap. Radio, TV, YouTube, and Bloomberg Originals, Beyond the Bell. We'll see you again, same time, same place, tomorrow. <laughs>
on Bloomberg Radio. All right, folks, we are watching Amazon in the aftermarket. Man, shares are taken off in a big way as we've been breaking down. Right now, up about 11% in the aftermarket. It's already up almost 31% wow. here in 2023. Yep, a lot of moving parts. And I have to say, on our planning call, when I heard that Brad Stone was going to join us on Amazon, I was like, okay, that's all I need. So let's get to it. Brad, as you know, he is Bloomberg News Senior Executive Editor of Global Technologies, the author of two books on Amazon, uh, Jeff Bezos and the Innovation of a global empire and of course the everything store brad is there on zoom in san francisco brad thank you so much a lot going on and i know you and your team have been busy this week amazon um where should we start what do you think is the most important uh in this release so far yeah i, I think the question that was lingering over the company was whether it had slimmed itself down enough to, to boost profits whether with all the layoffs nearly three thousand this year alone it has made any progress in its effort to cut costs and match this new era of slowing post-pandemic growth. And Carol, you can see from a 12% after market mm -hmm. boost right now, investors are happy with what they're seeing on operating income, net income, and the durability of AWS. Do you see the good results today feeding through for Amazon through the end of the year, particularly as you mentioned on the piece about uh, cutting costs through cutting back on the workforce? How does Amazon sustain that growth this year? Yeah, I mean, we, we don't know. I mean, Amazon's performance is so tethered to the macroeconomic climate, and, and obviously with the growth report today, I mean, there, there, there are big questions about the health of the economy. I think, you know, what we're seeing with Jassy's comment about machine learning, making the ad business better, and how the AWS business, they're really pitching it as a way to do AI cheaper, more efficiently. Um, you know, they're trying to set this company up, not just for the next year, but for kind of this next era in Silicon Valley and say, like, this is the smart play. Whatever happens to the economy, this is the long-term smart play on AI. I mean, and the, the thing that we're highlighting on the Bloomberg, Brad, you know, they're talking about that second quarter net sales, 127 yeah. to 133 billion. The estimate out there is 130. I mean, it's a, it's a sizable, you know, range there, but it's upbeat. And so you do wonder about what they are seeing about the outlook that gives them at least comfort in putting this out here? Or how do you see it when they put out a forecast like that? I mean, the, they always leave their forecast l large enough to drive an Amazon delivery truck through, uh, you know, so I don't ever put, put that much stock in it. But look, I mean, this is like a beat across the board. Yeah. Even uh, physical store sales were a beat. Online store sales are a beat. Um, you know, so I think that, you know, they're, they're, they're seeing not just a kind of recovery in the top line, but all the things they've been working on for so many years, um, shorter delivery times, more fulfillment centers closer to customers, that these things are finally beginning to make a difference for, for customers and are a little bit more of a differentiator for Amazon to be fast oncoming competitors like Walmart.com, et cetera. Talk to me about the AI piece. We have in here um, some, I, I see six on the word count for AI here. Mm -hmm. uh, does that feel like enough to you? Does it feel like they're leaning into AI in this earnings report? I mean, every company is right now, and I, th I expect that on the media call at the d yeah. bottom of the hour and the analyst call at the top of the hour, it's going to be, you know, I AI like, like all these calls this week. But, I mean, the one explicit thing that they don't have is a consumer-facing, you know, large language model, mm -hmm. bot to help customers, you know, Alexa with a version of that, but it's a little generation old. And so they're pitching these these services to developers, like one is called Bedrock, um, where, you know, you can come and like tailor your own. So they're really seeing it as a part right now, at least, of, of, of AWS and making their business mm -hmm. and their AWS customers' business more efficient. You know, we'll see how much of that is like AI washing and how much is a real difference for competitors, I, for, uh, for, for their customers. I am blown away by the numbers. And I want to go back to physical stores. I mean, I guess, you know, because we all think about Amazon, we just order and it just shows up, you know, miraculously on our doorstep four point now almost five billion dollars in sales i mean is this something that they continue to invest in and build out or is it just again very cautiously but that's some real money i mean if anything carol it's the, it's the reverse i mean they've closed all the physical that's stores so the number you're seeing here is is whole foods i mean by and by and large so okay. you know they've been they've been cutting that business a little bit they've closed some stores I think I think that number shows like maybe some stability. Like they've closed mm -hmm. the bookstores, they've closed the four-star stores. Amazon Go has been whittled down to like a shadow of its former self. So, you know, they're they're done cutting, and perhaps that's reflective of maybe an overall sort of revival in just the supermarket category. 
Is there anything else that you think Amazon needs to do this year to control costs, or does this earnings outlook read to you as a company that uh, can happily continue to pour money back into itself? I mean, we're you know we're we're right in the middle of of the layoffs. I think this week was when they started the uh, the AWA AWS layoffs, and and the head of AWS described it as one of the worst days uh, for for the company. So, I think they probably announced most of the cost cutting they're going to do. Um, it's ongoing. It'll it'll take place throughout the quarter. And at this at this point, you know, and also yesterday, by the way, they canceled another product, the Halo wristband, so mm-hmm. one of their health mm-hmm. initiatives. So I think at, at this point. Most of the blood is probably on the floor, and you're right that from from here on out, it's going to be a uh, you know maybe a more careful and curated set of bets. You know, or Ed Ludlow pointing out, and this caught my uh, caught me too when I was reading through the press release. Um, in terms of advertising, their advertising services business sales coming in at 23 percent year over year, a 35 and a half percent outperformance wow. relative to consensus. Um, you know, we keep worried about anything ad related, ad connected. Uh, what is it that they are doing just so right, or is it just because they are so huge? They're such a big part of everybody's world, and they reach so many individuals, if you will, that that makes sense that they're really outperforming there. Well, what what they have said and what they want us to believe is that their investments in machine learning help match better match up ads with customers when mm-hmm. they're searching in the Amazon search box. You know, my view as a as, a, as an Amazon customer um, is that they're simply just flooding the zone. I, I just think that they have thrown open the search results to um, you know to paid results to the highest bidder and maybe there's a little machine learning there but it's the increasing willingness in the post Jeff Bezos era to really sell search to the highest bidder that has mm-hmm. that is the mainly powering that uh, that line Brad fast forward for me to which the... is a bummer for us then yes <laughs> but anyway but good for them sorry Maddie no 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 it's a, it's an excellent point Brad uh, fast forward to me for me to the end of this earnings season here. When we look at these Amazon earnings, is this going to be the quote unquote bellwether for big tech fueling continued gains in the S&P, um, you know, as we wrap up this earnings season? I, I think it's consistent, Maddie, with what we've seen from Meta, with mm-hmm. what we've seen from Alphabet. May I haven't been paying attention. I'm curious about Snap earnings today, but you know that we've been through a brutal period of you know regression in, in big tech stocks and a lot of cost cutting, high unemployment now in Silicon Valley, or at least increasing uh, unemployment, and you know a readjustment. And maybe this this quarter is going to mark kind of the turning point. Here, where we were, where as I said, you know, most of the pain has been endured, and these companies now, with their big bets on AI, right. are, are beginning to rekindle some of their momentum. Brad, you mentioned Snap, down 22% in the aftermarket, okay. reported its first ever decline in quarterly revenue after making some major changes to its advertising tools. So, quarter, first quarter revenue fell 7% to 988.6 wow. million. So it missed the average analyst estimate of about a billion. So yeah, not not good at all. Very different. Perhaps yeah. not consistent with the overall theme then. <laughs> well, it makes me wonder what Snap and Pinterest are doing differently because they did not perform well, but Amazon, Microsoft, Meta all performed great. About 20 seconds, Brad. Any thoughts on that? Well, it's a good question. Um, it, there, there might. It, it's probably um, the lack of kind of top-line user growth. I mean, yeah. Meta, Facebook, and Instagram added users. Snap has struggled with that. And... Um, you know, perhaps a little less global exposure than some of their competitors. Yeah, Snap had 383 million users daily in the first mm-hmm. quarter, in line with analyst estimates. Brad Stone, you're a gem. I know you're busy. I know your team is. We love it um, when you can join us. Uh, Brad Stone, there in San Francisco, our San Francisco bureau, joining us via Zoom. Uh, Jeff Bezos and the Invention of a Global Empire and the Everything Store. He knows so much about this company. Those are two books he's written. Check it out. Amazon's up 9%.
sports, headlines, and breaking news 24 hours a day at Bloomberg.com, on Bloomberg Television, and the Bloomberg Business app. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. Yeah, it's 421 on Wall Street. We do check markets all day long here at Bloomberg. We've got Amazon shares trading higher by 6.9% after ours. Amazon reported surprisingly strong quarterly sales in its cloud computing division. An overall profit that topped estimates, a sign the retailer's business is weathering an uncertain economy. Anurag Rana is with Bloomberg Intelligence, and he's been taking a look after ours at Amazon Web Services. Now, when you look at AWS, which drives most of the margins of the company, you know, about, I would say, 16, 18 months ago, their margins were around the 30% mark. They are at 24%. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that these cost cuts will help on the next few quarters. And when the demand comes back, we expect margins to climb back above 30%, uh, you know, back then. And again, after ours, uh, we've got Amazon shares bouncing around, but right now showing a gain of 7.3%. Snap reporting its first ever decline in quarterly revenue. The shares are plunging after ours. Shares of Snap Inc., they are now down by 20 one percent after ours. We'll have more on the Snap story coming up with our Alex Barinka right here on Bloomberg Business Week. Also reporting after the close of trading today, Intel. It reported data center and AI revenue for the first quarter to beat the average analyst estimate. As we sift through that report, we're looking at Amazon shares after ours down by 2.1 percent. Tech, certainly the story on Wall Street today. The Dow, the S&P, and NASDAQ all advancing. We had the S&P 500 index having its best day since January up 79 points today, a gain of 2%. The Dow today up 524, up 1.6%. NASDAQ up 287, a gain of 2.4%. Ten-year yield, 3.52%. The two-year, 4.07%. Cannot forget to talk about Meta Platforms. It surged 13.9% today. Spot gold, 1988. The ounce, little change there, down to dollar. Crude, West Texas Intermediate, up 7 tenths of 1%. 74.81 a barrel. Again, recapping after earnings, Amazon up 7.9%. And that is a Bloomberg Business Flash. All right, Charlie, thank you so much. Appreciate uh, the update and the uh, news about all of these earnings after the close. Charlie mentioned Amazon as he as we continue to cover it up about 8% in the aftermarket. Uh, he did also mention Snap, which is getting hammered. It's uh, off its lows in the aftermarket, but still down about 19%. Let's get to it uh, because some disappointments, certainly, as you can see by the, the share at, at trade here. Let's get to it with Bloomberg News technology reporter Alex Barinka. She's on Zoom in our LA bureau, covers this space. Um, Alex, a lot of disappointment. Why don't you walk us through the quarter and why investors are so disappointed here? Definitely a lot of disappointment. And, and I think that disappointment really is kind of floating around this top line. Revenue declined for the first time ever for this company that's always been seen kind of as a growth company. And, you know, there's a little bit of surprise here, too, because even though the company had guided for a revenue decrease, uh, they guided for a decrease in the first quarter. The, um, the forecast they're giving for the second quarter is another consecutive quarter of sales declines. Some of this is self-inflicted, too. Snap uh, told us three months ago that they're making a lot of changes to their advertising tools, and that would impact revenue for the quarter. Uh, they didn't say that it was going to kind of drag on for a while, which seems like it is what's happening here. Um, and, and when you kind of dig into the into um, layers deeper on the results I'm seeing here, another really important number for investors is users. Mm -hmm. User growth came in right at analyst estimates, so there's no kind of upside to offset that downside that you're seeing on the top line. Talk to us about the ad space and specifically Snap kind of tweaking the design of its direct response ads. You mentioned the impact of that. Uh, to what extent are these earnings and the market reaction about the ad space in particular for Snap? For Snap, it's all about that ad space. Um, they are a smaller player in the ad world. They have much less share than, say, Alphabet or Meta, uh, but the vast majority of their dollars come from advertising revenue. And historically, Snap has been stronger in something called brand advertising, which is kind of telling the big picture story of your brand, and less on what you mentioned, which is direct response ads, those ads where you see something, you click on it, you buy it right there. In the current economic environment, marketers are really preferring those direct response ads because 
They can directly tie return on investment. They can prove out saying somebody clicked on this dress video and bought this dress versus, you know, someone likes a brand better because of a brand advertisement. So to have Snap kind of playing around with those direct response ads, a lot of marketers have backed away, and it's clear that they're not spending on the platform. Now, the company will say they had to make these changes. This will improve their business in the long run, but it does seem like um, there is quite a bit, at least 20% downward pressure on the stock of impatience from investors in terms of the story that they're telling today. All right, so as you note in your story, and I'm looking at this was a stock that back in September of 2021 was above $83 a share. We're now just under $11. Okay, so a very different world. Um, um, and and, ter and ter certainly in terms of market value. You write in your story, though, Alex, you talk about how they have also been looking for new streams of revenue. And there's things about, you know, trying and close virtually uh, and other things. Are, is this something that could ultimately move that revenue needle and, and be a, a big driver of growth going forward? It potentially could. I actually chatted okay. to Snap CEO uh, about a year, uh, a week ago, talking at, at his product conference, um, you know, saying, hey, Snap looks like a very different company now. They're doing things like selling subscriptions. They're doing things like selling uh, software to businesses. It's a really interesting moment for them. So there's potential there, but these things are so early days that they're not offsetting the losses they're seeing from the ad business. I want to talk about the meta piece because they had a big win yesterday and they also had a big win when it came to their ads and their ad revenue, which was critical to watch as it was with Snap today. Does the win for meta yesterday make the results today from Snap even worse for investors? Sort of. So Meta's story is a little bit different because of how big they are. They have certainly been challenged by um, kind of the, the general dismalness of the ad business by marketers pulling back spending. But their business is so much bigger, and Snap is so much more of a kind of real true growth company that that's all Snap kind of has the ability to rely on. Snap has also, you know, cut costs. They've done a lot of the things we've seen from the bigger players, but because folks really kind of bet on them for that kind of all-in growth, a uh, 100% quarter over quarter in past years, to see that number fall uh, makes it a little bit challenging. With Meta, you know, the big question for them has been, uh, okay, you have this big core ad business. Are you spending enough time there to make sure it's still going well in this challenge ad environment? And also, what else are you spending on? This whole metaverse thing is not something that uh, we will realize in the next decade or so. And it, are those dollars actually going to things that are going to increase the value of the business? So uh, kind of some, similar kind of wins affecting both of those companies. But I think they're just kind of size and status in the ad market makes it a little bit of a different tale. Oh, you know, Alex, I always think about you know, more broadly what's going on in social media and just all the things, whether it's apps, whether it's streaming services, everything competing for our attention. At some point, there's got to be a little bit of a bust. And I, I think of this, uh, I caught up with Alexis Ohanian this week, right, the co-founder of Reddit. You know, and he too said, you know, social media, you know, culturally maybe going to go through a rethink, if you will. How do you look at it? And so, is it a case of some of the smaller guys are going to fall to the wayside? Or, I don't know, how do you think of it big picture? And then how do investors need to think about it, maybe for some shifts that might be to come? It's a really interesting moment, and I'll actually use Meta's earnings to kind of illustrate this. For, you know, as long as we've had social, it's really been about who follows you and kind of developing that following and, and choosing the people you follow. When TikTok kind of smashed on the scene, they changed the game. They made it about uh, what content is best and what content's going to resonate with the user's interests instead of with the people that that user will follow. Meta, YouTube, they've all copied um, kind of that TikTok idea where now your feed is full of things they think you might be interested in that's selected for you by an algorithm less so your friends and family. And so Meta and Alphabet have been trying to kind of figure out how to match ads with those interest groups on this new kind of world, whereas Snap has taken a little bit of a different approach. They have always had kind of the core feature of Snapchat being person-to-person -person communication, that kind of closed loop. But I will say it's really interesting in the last few weeks here, Snap has announced that more people can now post content publicly. So you're seeing some kind of changes. And I I think there's this really interesting tension right now between yeah. folks wanting to stay connected with friends and family and a lot of the platforms
platform starting to move away from that in favor of showing you things that are maybe more entertaining, maybe more in the uh, taking screen time from the Netflixes and Hulus of the world, but it's less about, you know, your your aunt in Texas or your friend who's living in New York City. Yeah, hey, that's really funny. Yeah, no, it, it's so true. I've been spending a little bit, like, for the first time, I'm finally, like, checking out TikTok. I know I'm a little bit slow to the game, but kind of playing around with that more than, like, sitting down for hours, you know, <laughs> binging on a series. Yeah. No, I, I do it sometimes when I don't have the energy to pick a show. Um, <laughs> Alex, I want to end on your story about big tech being obsessed with cost cutting, uh, except for when it comes to AI. Tell me what's going on there. Yeah, I, I kind of made the argument in our newsletter today that AI is coming for your jobs, just not the way you thought. Meta, Alphabet, Microsoft, they've all come out kind of promising these big cost cuts while also kind of emphatically reminding investors that they're spending tons of money on AI. So where is that money coming from? Uh, you can look back to the 40,000 positions that they've eliminated over the past few months uh, to kind of keep those savings and reinvest those funds into artificial intelligence. So in this kind of big AI arms race that we're in right now, a lot of that's being interestingly funded by big tech from the dollars that are not going to headcount, that are not going to offices, that are only going to kind of the products that are getting folks really excited and leaving a lot of former employees kind of out to dry. Good to be a, good to be a programmer right now, really, uh, you know. <laughs> um, hey, uh, really quickly, 15 seconds, what would you ask Snap on the earnings call? I want to know at what point revenue turns around, the changes that they're making, when do those kick in, and when do they start luring advertisers to keep uh, that top line from continuing to slip. All right, great stuff as always. Our Alex Barenka, Bloomberg News technology reporter there in L.A. Uh, and check out her newsletter. You can find it, uh, Bloomberg Tech Daily Newsletter. Just sign up at Bloomberg.com slash technology. All right, let's get back to World of National News. Nancy Lyons in D.C. Hey, Nancy. Thanks, Carol. South Korean President Yoon suk yeol is hailing his country's partnership with the U.S. He spoke today to a joint session of Congress. Our alliance is stronger than ever more prosperous together, and more connected like no other. Indeed, it has been the linchpin safeguarding our freedom, peace, and prosperity. Yoon says South Korea will stand together with the U.S. to serve as a compass for freedom to protect and broaden liberty. Yoon's speech comes a day after he held a summit with President Biden where they pledged to further strengthen their military alliance. The Biden administration will be expanding legal pathways for immigrants to the U.S. and will stiffen border enforcement and open regional processing centers in Latin America. That's to try to dissuade U.S.-Mexico border crossings. Senior administration officials outlined the approach today two weeks ahead of the planned expiration of the pandemic-era border restriction known as Title 42. Well, during cross-examination today in a New York courtroom, a lawyer for Donald Trump pressed the former president's rape accuser, raising questions about what he called her odd claim and suggesting she made up the attack to sell a book. Eugene Carroll acknowledged certain parts of her story are, quote, difficult to conceive of, but added, those are the facts. Attorney Joe Tacopina asked Carroll why she didn't go public or report the alleged assault to police before Trump was elected in 2016 suggesting she timed her allegation with the publication of her 2019 book. Carol denies that, saying she didn't want to distress her mother and also kept silent out of fear Trump would destroy her reputation. Carol has accused Trump of raping her in a dressing room of the Bergdorf Goodman department store in the 1990s. Trump has denied her story and says she was not his type. Jill Schneider, Bloomberg Radio. Global News, 24 hours a day, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries.
markets, headlines, and breaking news 24 hours a day at Bloomberg.com, on Bloomberg Television, and the Bloomberg Business App. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. On Wall Street, we do check markets all day long here at Bloomberg. Intel, the biggest U.S. chip maker, is lower after predicting a steeper loss than expected, signaling that its turnaround effort does remain on shaky ground. Also reporting after the close of trading, Amazon. It is surging after its profit and cloud unit sales topped estimates. Brad Stone heads up a tech coverage for Bloomberg News. This is like a beat across the board. Yeah. Even uh, physical store sales were a beat. Online store sales were a beat. Um, you know, so I think that, you know, they're, they're, they're seeing not just a kind of recovery in the top line, but all the things they've been working on for so many years, um, shorter delivery times, more fulfillment centers closer to customers, that these things are finally beginning to make a difference. And after ours, we do have uh, shares of Amazon. They are pushing higher by roughly 8%. Snap reported its first ever decline in quarterly revenue after making major changes to its advertising tools. Alex Barenka covers this company, and she was a guest right here on Bloomberg Business Week. When you kind of dig into the into um, layers deeper on the results I'm seeing here, another really important number for investors is users. Mm -hmm. User growth came in right at analyst estimates, so there's no kind of upside to offset that downside that you're seeing on the top line. And after our shares of Snap, they are plunging now by 19 percent an update for the dow the s p and nasdaq in fact equities rose the most since january treasuries retreated after solid earnings from tech companies blotted out the impact of a report showing slowing economic growth and higher than forecast inflation s p up 79 a gain of two percent the dow up 524 up 1.6 percent nasdaq up 287 a gain of 2.4 percent tenure yield 3.52 percent with a two-year yield of 4.07 percent. Spot gold down one tenth of one percent, 1987 the ounce. And West Texas Intermediate crude up eight tenths of one percent, 74.87 a barrel. I'm Charlie Pellet, and that is a Bloomberg Business Flash. All right, Charlie, thank you so much. Carol Masser, along with Madison Mills, live in our Bloomberg Interactive Brokers Studio on YouTube and Bloomberg Originals. So talk about being stuck between a rock and a hard place. This story among our most read on the Bloomberg on this Thursday on First Republic, whose shares did shoot up today, still down more than 90% this year. So we'll get into that rock and the hard place. So let's get to our story. Bloomberg News finance reporter Jenny Serain is here in our Bloomberg Interactive Brokers Studio. It's not easy being First Republic. <laughs> no. So what's going on here? So, I mean, you know, they have been swept up in the regional bank turmoil that has mm -hmm. really affected a lot of their peers, um, but they seem to be really taking the brunt of investors' fears. And, and really, it started last month. You know, folks started taking a look at the assets that they have, realizing that they were just, um, you know, worth a lot less than, than people maybe realized and, and wanting to kind of see this company make some moves. And I think now where we've gotten to is you had a pretty disastrous earnings report on Monday. Um, you know, the biggest U.S. banks are, are kind of waiting around and thinking that the government might want to step in. The government, on the other hand, is, is not in quite that mindset. And so um, you've really reached a standoff where it's just kind of in limbo for, for the next little bit. It's like you want to see who blinks next or blinks first, right? Yes, exactly. Yeah, that feels like the question, right? It's like, do they fail? Do they get bailed, bailed out? Or do they sell? It kind of feels like one of the three. Yeah. And so everyone we have been talking to and, and all of our sources, and we've written many stories about this this week, yeah. you know, there's lots of different ideas and, and lots of different, you know, proposed rescue plans. Um, and we really just haven't seen a lot of headway and movement on them. And, and it's kind of unusual given how quickly things happened with Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank, you know, just a month ago. But I think, you know, what we're really learning here is that there is no playbook for any of this. You know, regulators aren't looking to, like, have the exact same model for each bank that comes in distress. Um, and so, you know, I think it's just we're in a wait-and-see mode until until things get resolved. So tell us, you know, why is it that, and just remind us, why First Republic is in such a bad way? Because we've talked a lot about different regionals, especially as we've gone through earnings, and not everybody's the same and not everybody has the same exposure. Remind us why it's been so tough for FRC. Yes. So they are they are really um, so some of their problems are you know the same problems that are hitting everyone you know a lot of banks um, back in the period of really low interest rates looking for yield invested parts of their balance sheet into bonds now you know a few years on as 
rates have gone up, those bonds are worth less. Um, and so they have a little bit of that problem, just like everyone else, and, and everyone's dealing with that. And the other unusual thing about First Republic, though, is that another big thing that they did, you know, during this period of really low interest rates was make a ton of these really big mortgages to wealthy individuals. Um, these mortgages came with very uh, rock bottom rates. They were very attractive to the Hampton set or, you know, to those in Silicon Valley. That was another great story I believe you wrote. <laughs> and, yes, <laughs> exactly. And so, you know, it, it was it was a very um, lucrative and and exclusive clientele that they were chasing after and they successfully did that and now they've got all these mortgages sitting on their balance sheet that are just worth a lot less in a, in a rising rate environment and so that is really the problem that's facing them and that's the kind of idiosyncratic thing about First Republic that not a lot of other banks are dealing with and so because these mortgages are so weird and structured in a way that we don't really see very often um, it's just really hard to know like what they're truly worth it's hard to offload them um, and so that's that's kind of the problem facing First Republic. Does that tell you then that the First Republic story is is an acute one that's not, yeah. Yeah, I mean, so there's parts of it that a lot of other banks are facing, and, and then there's parts of it that is very uniquely First Republic. I I mean, I still think, you know, even throughout this earnings season, even as we've seen a lot of the share prices stabilize and, and a lot of more positive news, I mean, they're still all dealing with the fact that this is a rising interest rate environment. They all have the, a ton of these bonds sitting on their balance sheet that are worth a lot less in this environment, and that's a problem that they'll all continue to have to deal with, um, but they don't all have the jumbo mortgages made to the Hamptons and Silicon Valley said that First Republic does. Is that the bigger problem and is that the bigger part of their balance sheet? Yeah. For First Republic, yeah. So How much bigger is it? Do we know? Yeah, no. So I, I think, you know, in most cases, it's the other way around where it's you had a bigger chunk of your, your balance right. sheet invested in these bonds and, and it's opposite for First Republic. A bigger chunk is dedicated to these loans that they were making for, for so many years. Um, and then on Monday, you know, you had them announcing we're going to slow growth, we're going to shrink our balance sheet. Um, and that's a real scary thing for investors who are like, wait, you've been growing for all these years and, um, you know, now we're facing year, you know, quarter after quarter of operating losses and so that's what's also been sending these shares down all this week, kind of reigniting the fear that, that something is really wrong here. Except for today. Except for today. I mean, you know. But, I mean, It's still on. down 90% this year, so. <laughs> all right, all right, all right. Perspective. <laughs> Jenny, what I do wonder is, and I, I think about the great financial crisis, right? Lehman went down and, like, everybody freaked out because it was like, okay. So if the government lets First Republic go down, will it? kind of create nervousness again, even though other regional banks are different and maybe don't have the same exposure, could we assume that there would be another kind of nervous component brought back into the market? Because we're still not out of the woods with all these banks yet. I think, I mean, I'm sure that that's one of the things that the government is thinking. Like, you know, if this fails and if this falls into receivership, who's next? And so I, I think that's a very delicate balance. And But I also think that they're kind of taking each thing, um, each bank, you know, on a case-by-case -case basis and, and they can't paint too, you know, wide of a brush. Something that might help First Republic would, you know, maybe not help everyone. And so that's also something that's probably really hard for them as they try to come up with, you know, whatever they can come up with to stabilize this bank. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's just hard. What are your sources telling you about how this ends? That, that's, that's I mean, question. we really tried to capture that with our story this this morning. You know, it's, I think we're hearing a lot of the different proposals that have been written about, you know, not just by us, but by many outlets, like looking at, you know, the big banks banding together and doing another industry-led rescue. But we're hearing a lot of hesitant on the side of those big banks. You know, we've already invested $30 billion in deposits and um, to buy them more time and, and, you know, look what they've done with that time. And so... I think there's this definite push and pull, and, and I think the end result of what we're ultimately hearing is, is what we tried to write, which is there is this standoff going on over over the future of First Republic, and, and it's really unclear, you know, how this ends. Um, clock is ticking now. Clock is ticking, yeah. I mean, and, and I, to be fair, they could continue on in their existing form. I mean, mm -hmm. as long as you don't see another heavy withdrawal, um, that is something we, you know, we don't have immediate, you know, day-to-day -day insight into. And so as long as they don't see another big outflow of deposits, they could continue to hum, a, I mean, hum is probably a yeah. strong word, but move along, um, you know, facing losses and, and kind of just dealing with this as they can. Your story, though, noting that in terms of the executives at the biggest banks, mm -hmm. one expressing a willingness to participate only if regulators force the group to take action. 
And I, I think that that's, it's an interesting element because there, even as much as the government might not want it to be a precedent, there is a precedent set by the two banks that failed last month. You know, they yeah. fell into receivership, they got bought at bargain low prices, and now that's what everyone's kind of waiting for. Well, we're waiting and watching and waiting for your next story. Jenny Serene, thank you so much because we know this story will keep on giving. Finance reporter at Bloomberg News here in studio. This is Bloomberg. Company News Headlines on Bloomberg Radio. From Bloomberg World Headquarters, I'm Charlie Pellet. Lots of earnings after the close of trading the biggest though, Amazon.com. And it reported surprisingly strong quarterly sales in its cloud computing division. An overall profit that topped estimates. After ours, Amazon up right now by 7.5%. Snap plunging. It reported its first ever decline in quarterly revenue. Snap down by 20%. Intel lower after predicting a steeper loss than expected. Intel after hours down now by 1.3%. Cloudflare plunging 25% after the cybersecurity focused software company issued a weaker than expected revenue forecast. Hertz Global Holdings beat estimates for the first quarter as the company continues to ride a rebound in travel and it has kept costs in check thanks to stable used car prices. Stephen Scherer is the CEO of Hertz Global Holdings. You know, I think there's an interesting aspect to the corporate travel with kind of dovetails with a bit of the headline out of the GDP number today, which is I think corporations are reluctant to make major capital investments, and you saw that in some of the underlying factors to the GDP number. 
but their sales forces are out in force and they are out spending time with customers. That's a good thing for the travel industry because they're renting cars and flying on planes and staying in hotels. And Hertz shares rallied today by 6.1%. Gap out of San Francisco is eliminating 1,800 positions as part of a broader restructuring plan. Gap up today by 5 tenths of 1%. Those are our top company stories, and this is Bloomberg. <laughs> This is Bloomberg Business Week with Carol Messer and Tim Stenevec on Bloomberg Radio. Hello, everyone. I'm Madison Mills here in our interactive brokers studio with Carol Masser. We are going to bring you some more headlines, especially after that big earnings report from Amazon. But first, let's get a check on the latest world and national news with Nancy Lyons in D.C. Hey, Nance. Thanks, Madison. With a public health rule due to expire next month, deportations at the southern border are being expedited, and Secretary of State Antony Blinken is taking steps to ease concerns about a surge of illegal immigration. Soon, we will stand up regional processing centers in select locations in the region. Secretary Blinken and Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas call the end of Title 42 a hemispheric challenge. The centers will first be located in Guatemala and Colombia. They'll screen migrants to see if they're eligible for refugee status, a variety of humanitarian parole programs, even employment access. In a surprising move, a federal judge did not issue a decision today on whether the National Guardsman accused of leaking sensitive material will be kept behind bars until his trial. We get more from Bloomberg's Janet Wu. The government argued that Teixeira is a flight risk and could be harbored by hostile nations interested in sensitive intelligence. The defense put Teixeira's biological father on the stand. The senior Teixeira was once a corrections officer and promised he could keep his son secure in home detention. After 90 minutes, federal magistrate judge David Hennessy said he would take the matter under advisement and would release his ruling later electronically. From the federal courthouse in Worcester, Massachusetts, Janet Wu, Bloomberg Radio. A diabetes drug being tested for weight loss is apparently working. Drug maker Eli Lilly reported today its drug, terzepatide, helped people with diabetes who are overweight lose up to 60% of their body weight over 17 months. And that for those without diabetes, the drug prompted body weight losses of more than 20%. Sold as Mangero for diabetes, Lilly says it's applying for fast-track approval from U.S. regulators for weight loss use. Global News, 24 hours a day, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Nancy Lyons. This is Bloomberg. All right, Nance, thank you so much. You are listening and watching Bloomberg Business Week. Carol Master along with Maddie Mills. A lot going on here, folks. Um, so just to get back to some of the big earnings, you know Amazon reported after the closing bell, and we saw, Maddie, that stock just take off. Um, just skyrocketing. Uh, and I'm just taking a look at the trade. Still up about 7.2%, but definitely off its best levels of the session. And this is on top of a nearly 31% gain prior to this uh, release. And the second quarter outlook, net sales, uh, they put out a forecast of 127 to 133 billion. The estimate out there is 130.1 billion. So they that's a fair amount of upside performance, our Brad Stone said. But keep in mind, they put out these forecasts and there is a pretty big hole. Um, so they 